Welcome to another episode in our series, The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. In our episode this time, we are going to be looking at the secrets of the psychics, from prophets to prophets. You know, if you visit Greece today, you can go to the city of Delphi. Now, in Delphi, the ancient Greeks had what they called the oracle. This was a place where the the sibyls, or psychics if you like, sat on a tripod over a crack where fumes came up and they were said to be able to predict the future for people who wanted to know what the future held. Now, very famous people came here to consult with the oracle or to find out what their future held by visiting the oracle. People like Croesus, the king of Lydia, came here. Not only that, Alexander the Great sought to know the future from the oracle. There was also the Emperor Nero who consulted the oracle of Delphi, as did the Emperor Hadrian. Many different people wanting to know in ancient times what the future held by visiting the psychics here at Delphi. Do you know in more recent times there are other famous people who have sought to know the future from the psychics. For example, Abraham Lincoln and President Theodore Roosevelt consulted psychics, it's believed, in order to help them in their work and so on. And there are some very famous psychics that many thousands of people seek today for information to know their future. People like Sylvia Brown, a great psychic there uh, in, uh, that, that helps or tries to help many people know the future, Sylvia Brown. Then, of course, today you can visit many people who say they can tell the future. You go down to a, a market on a Sunday somewhere in Australia, somewhere or New Zealand, and you'll see people set up their little booth for reading the palms of people's hands and they use the tarot cards and so on to try to tell the people what their future holds, the psychics we call them. One of the most famous psychics was Edgar Casey, also known as the sleeping prophet. Edgar Casey made some uh, was sought by various people when he was uh, uh, at work here and living. Probably the most famous of the psychics was Gene Dixon. Gene Dixon, it said, predicted the suicide of Marilyn Monroe and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And we're going to have a look at some things about Gene Dixon as we move a little further into our program this afternoon to see whether she a real prophet, a psychic or not. Now, prophets are like this are making big profits today. The prophets, prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, are making big profits, P-R-O-F-I-T-S, profits. They're making a lot of money out of their business, in other words. And not only that, but there are many Christians today who believe they have prophecies from God. Scores of Christians today are claiming to have prophecies from God. There among Christianity today. Now, Christ gave some strong warnings against false prophets. He made some very strong statements. Notice what he said. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, he said, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Notice that clear warning from Jesus. In fact, he went on to say in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, sometime earlier he had said these words, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, said Jesus Christ. Now, if there are false prophets, this would indicate that there must also be genuine prophets because you don't warn just against the false prophet when you do that, you're also indicating perhaps there's true prophets as well. So we need to know the difference between the two. And in fact, that's exactly what we find in the Bible. There will be genuine prophets among the false prophets. In fact, genuine prophecy, Jesus predicted through his apostles in the New Testament, the gift of genuine prophecy would be seen in the end times. Notice what Paul said here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore, he said, 
when he ascended up on high, that's Jesus, when Jesus went back up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now you will notice what some of those gifts were. Among those gifts was the gift of prophecy. Notice what Paul went on to say, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teacher. Notice among the gifts, one of those gifts would be the gift of prophecy, said the Apostle Paul. One of the gifts. Now, how long were these gifts to be in operation for? Notice what the Bible says here. First, Paul, First Corinthians 1 verse 7, Paul is talking, he says, So that you come be short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says that these gifts stay in operation until the coming of Jesus. He said, you come behind in no gift while you are waiting for the day of Christ's return. Now let's have a look at the work of a prophet for a moment. A prophet's work actually is summed up in the word prophet. Many people think prophet's work is about predicting the future. In actual fact, for many prophets in the Bible, this was a very small part of their work because the word prophet means much more than that. In fact, the pro word prophet itself means this. The word prophet means one who speaks for someone. Prophet comes, has two words, pro meaning for or on behalf of, and fetis is the word speak in Greek, and it means to speak for someone. So a prophet was a spokesman or a messenger for someone else. That was the work of a prophet. Now notice what sort of work they would do for the people of God. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. As these prophets spoke for God, what were they trying to do in their work? Notice what the Bible says here in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. For the equipping of the saints, he gave them for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect or mature person to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about, he said, with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now what is Paul saying here? Let's put up here, the clear work of a prophet, among other gifted people, the prophets being mentioned, this was their function, this was their purpose. Number one, they were to bring unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus. Unity of faith and unity of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Number two, they were to bring Christians to maturity to help grow them up in Christ Jesus. Number three, they were to help them be stable in their lives, not blown about by this teaching or that teaching, but so that they would be stable, balanced Christians. And finally, the prophet's work was to make us Christ-like, to grow us up into the image of Jesus Christ. What an amazing picture that the work of God's prophets were to do there by Paul. And finally, there was one other, and that was this, to prepare God's people to serve others, to prepare them for works of service. God's people are not here just for themselves. They are here to serve other people and the work of the prophet was to help them so they could do that very work of working for other people. Now why would God send his prophets? Why would he do that? For one clear great teaching and that was this, his love for his people. Christ loved his people, God loves his people, and so he sends his prophets. For example, you will recall King David. On one occasion, David was sitting in Jerusalem while his soldiers were up at Amman fighting a battle. And as David was sitting in Jerusalem in his palace, he looked out of his palace one day onto the rooftop of another house nearby, and there he saw a woman taking a bath. He thought, I like that. So David contacted the woman and said, come on, let's go to bed together. And that's exactly what happened. This woman, Bathsheba, slept with David. And the, man's, the wife's husband was Uriah. 
And he was at the battle up there in Amman in Jordan today, in the city of Amman. Well, David wanted to cover up his act because this woman was a married man, so how could he cover it up? Well, he heard that Uriah had come back from the battle because evidently he wasn't far away from Jerusalem. Really come back just to, for, I guess, a bit of rest and relief. And uh, David asked him to come to the palace and he said, listen, here you are back home. Why don't you go sleep with your wife? And he's trying to cover this thing up. But the man wouldn't. He said, how can I do that? When my fellow soldiers are up there fighting a battle, I can't enjoy the privileges of marital life while my friends are fighting a hand-to-hand battle and could lose their life. I can't do such a thing, he said to David. Well, David wanted to cover up this act by getting this man to sleep with his own wife. So he said, come to my house for a meal. And when he came to David's house for a meal, David got him drunk gave him alcoholic wine and got him drunk, but the man still wouldn't do this. And so David wondered, what can I do? And then he came up with what he considered a bright idea. He wrote a letter to the general, General Joab there at Amman, and he said, Joab, put this man Uriah right up in the front lines, right against the wall. Now that really was a death sentence because the soldiers in the front line right next to the wall of a city where they could rain down arrows on them and and even sometimes in some battles, you know, hot stuff on top of their heads. This was a death warrant, a, a death sentence really. And he then gave that letter to Uriah himself to deliver to Joab the general. And so Uriah went back to the battlefield when he'd finished his rest and recreation there in uh, rest and relief there in Jerusalem, went back to the battlefield and was killed there at Amman. And David thought he'd covered everything up now because Uriah had come home and now he thought he'd covered the whole thing up because the man was gone. And David was living in sin, as you can appreciate. And he was starting to lose his hold on God. Well, God loved him. And God did not want this man to lose eternal life because he was in danger of that. When you sin like that and move away from God, we're in danger of losing eternal life. Unless we turn back, we will. So God sent a prophet. His name was Nathan. And one day Nathan showed up at the palace of King David. And he said to to David, David, there's been a terrible thing that's happened in your empire. He said there was this poor man who had one sheep in in his field That's all he could afford. He he was such a poor man. And one day his neighbour, who was a very wealthy man, had some friends coming to his house, their house for lunch. And he thought, man, I've got to kill an animal of mine and feed this man some food. He thought, I don't want to kill one of my animals. So he looked over the fence and saw his poor neighbour with one, one sheep. He stole the sheep, killed the sheep, cooked it up and gave it to his friends who had come for dinner. And David looked at Nathan, he said, oh, that man, bring him to me and I'll kill him for such an unkind thing that he's done. And Nathan looked at David right in the eyes and he said, David, you are the man. This is just a parable I've told you, told you about. The story is about you. You stole a man's wife. You killed that man's wife and you have done evil in the eyes of God. And David realised that God had sent this prophet to show him his great sin. And you read in Psalm 51, as it dawned on David now even more, how, how far he'd strayed from God. In Psalm 51, he said, Have mercy on me, O God, and blot out my sin. And God forgave him. Oh, he suffered some terrible consequences because we sow what we, we reap what we sow, but God forgave him and he will be in eternity thanks to a prophet of God who was sent to help this man. That's the work of the prophets, to help God's people. Now, how does God communicate his messages to the prophets? Well, there are two basic ways. Number one, the Bible says that God communicates with prophets through dreams and visions. Notice what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, the Bible says. Now, the second way God communicated with these prophets was this. He impressed their minds. The Holy Spirit impressed their minds. Now, notice what the Bible says here when we go to the writings of Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, the Bible says these words. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved 
or inspired or impressed by the Holy Spirit. So God impressed the minds of the prophets as well as giving them dreams and visions. Now, not all prophets in the Bible wrote scripture. For example, have you ever read the writings of John the Baptist? And yet Jesus said John was the greatest of the prophets, but he never wrote a book in the Bible. Have you read the writings of the prophet Agabus? He's mentioned as a prophet in the New Testament, but you don't read the book of Agabus. Have you ever read the writings of the prophet Elijah or Elisha? Great prophets in Israel, but they never wrote in the scriptures evidently. And certainly not a book after their name. So you don't have to be a prophet or to write the Bible to be a prophet, even in Bible times. Not only that, it's, prophecy is not just a men thing, not just for the males. Even females were prophets in the Bible. For example, one of the greatest of the prophets was Deborah during the period of the Judges, and she instructed the men what to do for God, it tells us in the book of Judges. Then Huldah was a prophetess. On top of that, Philip, one of the, one of the deacons in the New Testament church, he had four daughters who were prophetesses. Now, how do we know the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet? How would we know the difference? Well, let me tell you how we would know the difference. If you want to know, say you were assigned a task to find counterfeit notes, counterfeit dollar notes or $10 notes or $100 notes, the simplest way to be able to detect a counterfeit note would be to know the genuine one so well that you would easily see when a counterfeit came along. The way to know a counterfeit is to know the true ones very well, to know very clearly what a genuine one is because then you'll easily find a counterfeit. Now here are the tests of a true prophet. So let's look at the test for a true prophet and then we'll be easily able to detect a false prophet because of the principles the Bible shares with us. Number one, a prophet to be a prophet of God, that is, a genuine prophet, had to have prophetic accuracy at a batting average of 100%. The Bible puts it this way in Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 9. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So the prophet's words must come to pass. He must have a batting average of 100%. Now, Jean Dixon, I mentioned her earlier, who predicted the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the suicide of Marilyn Monroe, she had a batting average of about 30, between 30 to 60%, which was quite high for psychics. But she's not a true prophet because her batting average is not 100. For example, she predicted that the world, the world would be plunged into World War III in about 1953 by China. Well, that's never happened. Not going to happen. Too late now. She's a false prophet according to the Bible. She's not a genuine prophet. You have to have a batting average of 100% because God knows the future and he reveals that to his prophets. Now, the average leading psychic's batting average today is only 16%. Only 16. 16 out of every 100 predictions they make are right. Only 16. Number two test is biblical faithfulness. A prophet must be faithful to the word of God. What he says must agree with the Bible. Notice what the Bible says. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and he gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or the wonder comes to pass of which he spoke to you saying, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of the, that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. In other words, if a prophet makes all sorts of predictions, even if those predictions actually come true, but it actually he's speaking against God's word, you know he's a phony. He's not speaking according to the word of God, the commandments of God. He's not faithful to the Bible and the teachings of Scripture. Number three, test of a true prophet of God is that prophet must exalt Jesus Christ, must lift him up. Notice how the Bible puts this. 
Peter talking, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. That's to us today. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, those ancient prophets, was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. Notice what Peter is saying there. He was saying very clearly now that a prophet will point to Jesus Christ. The Old Testament prophets pointed forward to Christ who was yet to come. The New Testament prophets would point to Jesus who had come. That's why the Bible is very clear that a prophet will exalt Jesus Christ. If a prophet doesn't exalt Jesus, he's not a genuine prophet. So anybody who claims to be a prophet but doesn't somehow point people to Jesus is not a genuine prophet. He must lift up Jesus as Jesus is spoken of according to the Bible. He is God in human flesh. He died for the sins of the world and so on. Now the prophet must be commandment keeping as well. He must follow the counsels of God's commandments. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah. Isaiah speaking says in Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the testimony, to the commandments of God and the scriptures in other words. Notice what he says here. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, the word of God, the commandments of God, it is because there is no light in them. A prophet must agree with the Bible unless he does speak according to the commands of God, the law of God, the testimonies. It's because there's no light in them, says Isaiah. Finally, a prophet must have spiritual fruitage in his life. He must have the fruits of the Spirit seen in his work and in his life. Notice what this book says. Jesus is speaking here in Matthew 7, verse 15 and 16. He says, Beware of false prophets. You will know them by their fruits, by their lifestyle, their actions. Do they, are they good people? Are they faithful or are they sleeping around? Are they bad-tempered, grumpy people and so on? Are they disobedient in terms of God's commandments? Do they lie and cheat and steal? If they are, they're not a prophet of God if they live a life like that. So there are the tests for a true prophet. Notice them there on the screen right now. Number one, prophetic accuracy will be found among God's prophets, the tests of a true prophet, prophetic accuracy, biblical faithfulness. They must exalt Jesus. They must be commandment keeping and they will have spiritual fruitage, good fruits in their life. Now the Bible tells us that in the end of time, God's end time remnant will have the gift of prophecy in their midst. God's end time remnant, his people of, uh, who, who are part of his prophetic great movement to preach the gospel, God's remnant will have the gift of prophecy. Notice what the Bible says. Christ, in fact, promised to his people the prophetic gift in the end of time. The Bible says, as we go to Revelation 12, verse 17 now, notice what John said. Let's go to that passage together now. John speaking here says, And the dragon, the dragon was angry or enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? If we go to the end of the book of Revelation, we are told very clearly by John what that is. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? He tells us in Revelation 19 verse 10, I am your fellow servant, he says, and to your brothers who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Notice what the testimony of Jesus is. It's the spirit of prophecy. Now, who are John's brothers? Who are the brothers of John? Let's have a look what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 9. John says, or is told, I am your fellow servant. An angel is speaking to John. He says, For I am your fellow servant and of your brothers, the prophets. So John's brothers are the prophets. And it's the prophets who have the testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. So what is the 
spirit of prophecy or the testimony of Jesus. It's the Spirit's gift of prophecy that the prophets had given, been given by the Holy Spirit. This is the testimony of Jesus. And that's only natural because what did the prophets do? They testified of Jesus. No wonder it's called the testimony of Jesus. The prophets testify of Jesus under the influence of the Spirit. It's the prophets who have this testimony of Jesus. The dragon. So let's read that text differently now, slightly differently. Let's notice how, what John is saying. The dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which means the Holy Spirit's gift of prophecy. That's what the remnant has, the Spirit's gift of prophecy. Now we should expect this. We should expect God to send the prophetic gift in the end of times. Why? Because in all critical periods in the, Christian, in the history of the, of the whole Bible, God sent prophets at very important times. You will recall that when God wanted to destroy the world with a flood, he sent a prophet called Noah. He's called that in the Bible, to warn the world. When God wanted to raise up the nation of Israel, he called a prophet. His name was Abraham. Abraham is called a prophet by the psalmist. When God's people were going into sin, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet, Jeremiah, Isaiah, to warn the people not to stray, but to listen to God's word, to follow his commandments. When God's people were in Babylon and they were stuck in that place, he sent prophets to encourage them in their captivity. One of those prophets was Daniel. Another one was Ezekiel to encourage them in their crisis. When God was about to send the Messiah, he sent a prophet called John the Baptist to show people the Messiah was coming. At every critical time in the history of our world, God has sent prophets for his people. So we should expect that in the end of time. In fact, God said it this way. Acts chapter 3, verse 21. God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And the Bible says he does nothing. Amos says, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. What a God. He uses his prophets to communicate to his people at important times in the history of this world. So the end time gift of prophecy will be found among God's remnant people, says John in Revelation 12, 17. They will have the testimony of Jesus or the spirit of prophecy. Now that of course means, number one, God's remnant people will be people of the Bible because the Bible itself is called the testimony of Jesus. It was inspired by the prophets under the Holy Spirit's influence. It was inspired by the Spirit, I should say, by through prophets moved by God. The whole Bible is called the testimony of Jesus. So God's end time people will be a people of this book, the Bible. But it means more than that. It means the book of Revelation because in John's Revelation he actually says that the book of Revelation is called the testimony of Jesus. Notice what he says as we begin the book. John, it says, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear and the words of this prophecy, the book of Revelation, which is called the testimony of Jesus Christ and to keep those things which are written in it. So God's people, God's end time remnant people of Bible prophecy, who come from all different groups as they come out of Babylon together, among God's end time remnant people of prophecy will be the, will be the fact that they look at the book of Revelation and take it seriously, and the book of Daniel, of course. But the book of Revelation in particular will be a book that God's end time remnant spend time in because it's God's message for such a time as this. But thirdly, God's end time remnant people of prophecy will have the gift of prophecy among them. That gift will be seen among God's end time people. That's what he's telling us. And the Bible predicted that as we near the end of time, there would be the gift of prophecy among God's end time people. In the Old Testament, notice what the Bible says here as we go back to the book of Joel. The book of Joel says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. 
your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, the Bible says. And that's in Joel's writings, chapter 2, verse 28 and 31. So the Bible even predicted in the Old Testament that the prophetic gift would be among God's people in the end of time. And John says the same thing in Revelation right there. Now, so let's have a look. Do we find the prophetic gift among God's end time people? Do we find that gift among the end time prophetic movement that God raised up right on time according to Daniel and Revelation as we've seen in this series already? Yes, we do. Let me share with you one person whom I believe has had this prophetic gift of God that was mentioned here. She was a woman by the name of Ellen G. White. Who was this woman? Well, she was a Methodist when she began her Christian journey, a lovely Methodist young woman. At 17 years of age, she had her first vision. But be, while she was just a little girl, she was only a, about seven years of age, when she was coming home from school one day and one of her friends threw a stone at her. Not much of a friend, but they were having a bit of a tiff evidently, or this girl got upset and threw a stone at Ellen as a young girl. It hit her in the face and it caused her such serious injury that she, could, she hardly had any more formal schooling after about nine years of age, no more formal schooling. Left her badly injured because of, of the force of the stone that hit her in the face. And so without any formal, much formal, more education, she was self-taught after that, read and so on herself and self-taught at home, but no formal education. Now this woman was given 2,000 visions during the course of her life, the rest of her life, from 17 years of age after she had her first vision. She had about 2,000 visions. During vision, sometimes supernatural things took place. For example, there were times when in vision she didn't breathe. Two or three hours went by, didn't breathe. In fact, one doctor came in trying to check this thing out. He didn't believe in such things could happen to anybody. So he came when he heard Ellen White was in vision and he brought things like a candle or a mirror to see whether she was breathing. And as she wasn't breathing for some time, he, he said, this is unbelievable. And he, he just left the place. He said, she's not breathing. Now, being supernatural things doesn't make it of God. It could be supernatural coming from the devil. So we need to apply the test to this woman. Was this a gift of God or was it coming from somewhere else? Let's have a look and apply these tests now to this woman. But before we do, let's notice what people have said about her work. Notice this statement here in uh, a, a, an amazing statement here. It says here, This remarkable woman, Ellen White, though almost entirely self-educated, has written and published more books in more languages which circulate to the greater extent than any other woman in history. This is George Wharton James in his book, California Romantic and Beautiful. Now, in other words, he's saying this is the most... This is the most written woman in history. And there's no question about that as we're going to see what she actually wrote as her time went on. So what were these biblical tests now that we need to apply to this woman? Test number one, remember, prophetic accuracy. Did she make predictions? Did she prophesy things? And did those predictions actually happen? Did they work out? Did she fulfill or were her predictions fulfilled? Not, notice some predictions that she made back toward the uh, early part of the 19th, the 20th century, 19th century, sorry, tw late, 20th, late 19th century, early 20th century, I should say. Notice what she wrote. Not long hence, she said, these cities will suffer under the judgments of God. She was talking about San Francisco and Oakland. She went on to say, San Francisco and Oakland are becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Lord will visit them in wrath. Now, that was written in 1902. Just a few years later, four years later, I think it was, in 1906, San Francisco suffered that horrific earthquake and uh, much of the city was destroyed as a result of the earthquakes that hit that great city of San Francisco. Interesting. Not only that, she said, as we come toward the end of the 19th century and move into the 20th century, notice what she said. She said, the tempest is coming. We shall see trouble on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea. 
navies will go down and human lives will be sacrificed by the millions. Now you see she wrote that in 1890. Not long after we had World War I when navies did go down and then quickly it was followed by World War II and more navies went down. Massive numbers of ships were sunk at sea by U-boats and so on during the First and Second World War there at that time. She said in 1906, Notice what she said, soon great trouble will rise among nations, trouble that will not cease until Jesus come. And as we said, on the heels of this came World War I, World War II, and now we have 30 wars almost every year somewhere on the planet since. Do you know, in the last century alone, 180 million deaths from war alone, this woman got it right. Her prediction did come to pass exactly. She also wrote things that would be happening in society and trends. Notice what she wrote about tobacco that was being smoked in her time, of course. Tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. In whatever form it is used, it tells upon the constitution, it is all the more dangerous because its effects are slow and at first hardly perceptible. Now, y y we don't appreciate that statement unless we appreciate what was happening at this time with tobacco. Tobacco was not seen as a serious health problem by most people back then. In fact, doctors were prescribing tobacco as medicine for some of their patients sometimes. And yet this woman wrote over a hundred years ago that it's an insidious poison, a malignant one. And of course today we now know the dangers of smoking. It was only in the 1950s that the US Surgeon General wrote about the fact that Tobacco causes lung cancer. And yet she'd written almost 100 years before that tobacco was a dangerous thing for the human body. To, for the human body. What about biblical faithfulness? Was she faithful to the Bible? Did she agree with Scripture? And did she uplift the Bible? Notice what she wrote when she was here. In our time, she said, in the time in which we're living, in our time, there is a wide departure from their doctrines. That's the doctrines of the Bible and the precepts of the Bible. And there is a need of a return to the great Protestant principle, the Bible and the Bible only, as the rule of faith and duty. Notice what she's saying here? The Bible, we must get back to the Bible. This was the principle on which the Protestant Reformation began and the Bible should be our number one book. She wrote uh, again in the book Cole Porter Ministry. Notice what she said about the Bible. She said, Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Now what was she talking about here? She was saying, My writings, her writings, are a lesser light. The Bible is the greater light. If people would only read Scripture, there would be no need for her writings, but her writings are to lead people back to the Bible, her lesser writings to the greater book, the Bible. Now, during the 19th century and 18th, 19th century, it, the Bible began to be attacked by Christians itself. They began to say, well, look, you can't trust all of the Bible. Now, this part is not true. It doesn't agree with science. That's the first three chapters. And then who's heard of a virgin birth? You better pull that piece out. And then what about a resurrection from the dead? All sorts of miracles and prophecies. Surely you can't have those things in a modern age. And so Christians themselves began to disbelieve the Bible. And notice what she said about this. And before long, by the way, all you had was two covers, the front and the back cover, because everything else was not inspired or not true, people were saying almost. Notice what she said about this sort of of a phenomenon that was going on. She said to people in her day, she said, notice it, cling to your Bible as it reads and stop your criticisms in regard to its validity and obey the word and not one of you will be lost. Notice what she says here. We need to take the Bible seriously. We need to follow the word of God and not one person will be lost if they only read the Bible and follow what it says. Good counsel at a time when people were moving away from the Bible. What about Jesus? Did she exalt Jesus Christ before people in her writings? Let's notice what she said. 
She wrote of Jesus, Lift up Jesus, you that teach the people. Lift him up in sermon, in song and in prayer. Let all your powers be directed to pointing souls that are confused, bewildered and lost to the Lamb of God. Lift him up, she said, the risen Saviour, and say to all who hear, Come to him who has loved us and has given himself for us. Do you notice what she did? She lifted up Jesus. It was her great aim to say, we must lift up Christ to the, as the saviour of the world. In fact, this woman wrote a number of books on the life of Jesus. You will notice here on this picture, The Desire of Ages, one of the best books on the life of Christ ever written. Then there's Steps to Christ, the Christ Object Lessons, which are the parables of Jesus and so on. These books directed people to Jesus Christ. She pointed them to Jesus. In fact, she said on one occasion, she said, it is your privilege to trust in the love of Jesus for salvation in the surest, noblest manner, to say he receives me, he accepts me as I am. Nothing so dispels doubt as coming in contact with the character of Jesus. What an amazing thing. That's what the prophets did and that's what she did. Lift up Jesus as the saviour of the world. Commandment keeping. Was she a commandment keeper? Well, when the, she first heard of the Sabbath, she couldn't actually see the importance of the Sabbath at first. It didn't dawn on her. Like so many people today, they first see the Sabbath and they think, what's, the, what's all that about really? Doesn't everybody keep the Sunday? But as she began to think of and study this, after about a two-year period, when she first came in contact, she said, this is the truth. This is the Sabbath of God, so I will follow it now that I see that it is the, the right thing to do. She was a commandment keeper. She believed in following God's word when she saw what God wanted her to do. What about spiritual fruitage of the life? Was there spiritual fruitage in her life? What was the result of her work? Well, of course, this woman in, instructed the Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which she became a part of it, time went on herself, she instructed them to build hospitals around the world and the Seventh-day Adventist Church runs many hospitals today. Why? Because she said that's what Jesus did. He went about not only teaching but healing broken bodies and it was largely through her influence she said we must get back to the Bible and what Jesus did. He healed the broken bodies of human beings and we must do the same. She said, God said, go to the world. That's what the book of Revelation says. That's what Jesus said to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Go into all the world, said Jesus. She said, we must go to the world. And she encouraged the church to move out into the world beyond the shores of North America and Australia and so on. And so today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church operates in over 209 countries, bringing the love of God to a world in desperate need. She said, listen, Young people must be educated. They must be taught because a Christian who's well educated and has Christian education be of great service to the world. And so through her influence, schools were established to educate young people to be a help to the community and to help other people be ready for the return of Jesus. In fact, over 7,800 schools are operated today by the Seventh-day Adventist Church and it has the largest uh, Protestant school system in the world today because of the influence of this lady. Now, one more thing you will notice. Uh, she not only believed in education, but she did it herself. Ellen White, her home was open to all sorts of people, even though she was a very busy person travelling and speaking and writing. Her home was open to many, and especially young people. She loved young people. In fact, the first Maori politician in New Zealand, Sir Maui Pamawi, was actually... It was, it was Alan White paid for his education to go to North America, to the United States, to study medicine. He became a doctor, came back to New Zealand and eventually became a politician. But this woman funded that man's fees because she believed in helping young people. She lived a good life. She lived in Australia for some time, up there near Newcastle, and she was loved by the people around her who were not of her own religious belief. Why did they love her? Because she was always so helpful. Anybody was sick, she would visit them. Anybody had a baby, she'd take something for them. She loved people and she loved her neighbours and loved other people. And that's why the newspaper wrote this when she died. 
the New York Independent newspaper, when she died in 1915, notice what the New York Independent said. She showed no spiritual pride and sought no filthy lucre. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess, the most admirable of the American succession. She lived a good life. Now, the fruit of Ellen White's life is also found in the lives of the people that follow her writings. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist church, of course, has her writings, but sadly not all Seventh-day Adventist Christians bother to read her writings, who could read them if they wanted to. Many have them, but, or don't have them, but they could buy them, but they just don't bother. But some do, many do, of course. And a survey was done not so long ago looking at the difference between those who read her writings and those who don't read them but could read them if they only took the time. Notice the difference between those two groups and on a number of questions. Four questions we'll take. Question number one, I have an intimate relationship with Jesus, this question. In other words, Jesus is my friend and I love him and I have a walk with him. You know, the results of that survey were this, that 82% for the readers could say, yes, I have an intimate relationship with Jesus, but only 56% for the non-readers. That's a significant difference. Question number two uh, was uh, this one. I have the assurance of being right with God. 82% for the regular readers and 59% uh, for the non-readers, you'll notice. That's a 23% difference. The assurance of being right with God, I know that if I die... I'll be ready to meet Jesus. A significant difference between readers and non-readers who could read if they only took the time. What about involvement in Christian outreach activities? Notice readers were 24% more involved than non-readers. Why? Because she says that's what we're here for. She said we must be like what the Bible says. We must be about our father's business, helping people. And so she, those who read them are encouraged to move out to help people. What about daily personal Bible study? Notice the difference here. 82% for the regular readers, 47% for the non-readers. That's a massive 35% difference. Now you may think if someone reads her writings, they're not going to have time to read the Bible, but the opposite there is found. The people who read her writings were more inclined to read the Bible because she said, get back to the Bible. Go back and read the Bible. That's the number one book. Mine's just a lesser light to lead people back to the greater light the Bible. You know, my friends, today we should not despise prophesying. The Bible says these words in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God, you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper, God says. When you and I follow the writings of God's prophets, we are helped in our lives, that's for sure. Despise not prophesying, said the Apostle Paul, Notice that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20. Despise not prophesying, but don't just accept it all. He says, test it. Test all things, hold fast that which is good. Now, as I've tested, it seems to me pretty clear that this lady was certainly a prophet of God, but you would have to test that for yourself. Now, of course, if you wanted to know whether the Bible is a true book or not, you wouldn't go to the internet and say, well, let's see what the internet says. What would you do? Well, you would read the Bible and as you read it, you would discover that it is true. And it's the same with her writings. If you want to know whether it's truth, don't go to the internet or some other book. Just have a read of something yourself and as you read it, compare it with the Bible. If it squares up, it's the truth. If it's not, well, move on. That's what the Bible says. So if you would like to have one of these books of Alan White, you can contact the people who have delivered this book off to you, this uh, DVD to you, and ask them if you can get a copy of one of her books so you can check that up for yourself. Now you'll have noticed in all of our series, this is the only time I've mentioned the writings of this woman, because man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from this book. My friend, God wants you and I to be ready for the coming of Jesus. That's why he sends us the prophets, the Bible prophets, the book of Revelation, and his prophets in modern times, according to the book of Joel. Thank God that he loves us that much. We're glad you were with us today in this search for the secrets of the psychics. Won't you join us in our next program together that we have? We're going to take an amazing journey when we look at Armageddon, fear no evil. Be with us in that episode of The Last Empire, Ancient Mysteries 
reveal the future.